Hey guys, this is Adam from the Out of Bounds Podcast. Uh, this is episode 18. We got a chance to chat with uh, Ted from Meyer Skis. Um, it was awesome. It was probably one of the most unique experiences we've had in terms of just getting to see hands-on what a company does. Um, he was great. We showed up early um, because we kind of got lost and then we had to ditch our bikes and then we walked and then it started raining and then we thought we were going to a coffee shop and then we ended up in not a coffee shop and a bunch of homeless people and which is fine. There's nothing wrong with homeless people, but it was just, it was definitely a strange walk over there um, for the time being. Uh, So we got there early and Ted was nice enough to show us around the whole factory. He gave us a tour of all the other businesses that are in what used to be an old Wells Fargo building um, and a spot where a bunch of Denver Nuggets players used to just hang out after games. Um, So it was pretty wild. There's like a safe that we actually got to record in uh, inside of a safe which is basically, I mean, it, it was pretty sick. And then they showed us the green room that they use for all the music events that they have at that facility. Went through, there's like to be outerwear. There's there's a bunch of like small businesses that do very specific things in there. And it's uh, it's super cool. There's a lot of buildings in like that in Denver where like there's five or six small businesses in there and like it's a shared office space. I know that there's a lot like that in a lot of cities, but in Denver, it seems like it's getting more and more popular because it'll be like a big industrial building And then you'll have a bunch of like small but super cool companies all within like two feet of each other, basically. It's a shared office space, but in an open format and everybody just kind of works together on it. Um, It was uh, it was great. So he gave us a tour of the outside first and then he gave us a full step by step tour, which you can catch on our YouTube page uh, of the Meyer Ski Factory, how they make skis, uh, the bar. There's basically they have a bar set up as you walk in. Uh, And you can just look through these big glass windows, kind of press your nose up against it and watch these skis being made, which is pretty insane. I don't think there's any, Ted calls it a craft skiery and that's like, he thinks it's the first of its kind or the first that's been called that. And it's definitely the first time I've heard anybody call it, uh, call it that. And it's, it's awesome just to watch their process, um, to be kind of involved in that I think is, uh, is super cool. They went through step by step. He gave us the full rundown. So I'm super grateful for, to Ted for taking the time out of his day. I'm sure he's a busy guy and showing us. Um, so I think you guys will really enjoy this episode. He's got some pretty pretty strong opinions about where things are going to go for Meyer, where things are at right now, the growth that he sees, um, and uh, and all kinds of stuff, man. And then, yeah, I mean, it's we pretty much gave a full full rundown it's actually it's 45 minutes of us just chatting but it's 45 minutes of like solid solid content there's not like a whole bunch of of nonsense in there um it's one of the cleanest episodes we've done and it's actually probably one of my favorite episodes um so definitely uh make sure you tell your friends about this one and uh enjoy that's what everybody does bro everybody has like fucking five ten minute intros i don't care as long as they get to hear me chat um in the end all right Hey guys, uh, thanks for listening to that episode. I don't need to. Hey guys, thanks for listening to that episode with Ted uh, from Meyer Skis. Definitely check those guys out on their social media at Meyer Skis. Their website at Meyer Skis. Meyer is M E I E R. I cannot believe that I spelled that right without looking at my notes. Um, but yeah, for sure, check that stuff out. Follow us on social media, obviously at Out of Podcast. Tell your friends about the show. Like, rate, review this deal. Um, on whatever medium that you're listening to it on. And uh, and uh, yeah, enjoy. We'll keep bringing you some more content from the Denver area uh, the rest of this week. Thanks. We are here with uh, Ted from Meyer Skis. Ted, what's going on, man? Uh, just here living the dream, or that's what they say anyhow. <laughs> um, so we'll kind of get into a little bit about you first and how you got into the industry, and then we'll jump into the whole shebang. We just saw the whole factory, and that'll be up on the... YouTube shortly here, but so how'd you get into the industry? I mean, how did this all start for you? Uh, you know, I think it probably starts with uh, skiing, right? Once upon a time. I don't think too many people get into this industry <laughs> right? uh, for the money. Yeah. Uh, it usually starts with the passion of the sport and skiing. Uh, so I grew up skiing up in Franconia, New Hampshire. Dad taught skiing forever, you know, certified ski instructor at Cannon and, uh, and Mittersill had a place in Franconia. So every weekend, every holiday, every vacation, and a whole lot of school hooky days when the snow was good, right. uh, we'd be on the snow. So just grew up skiing in New England, you know, went to University of New Hampshire, uh, 
never went to school on Wednesdays because it was two for one at Wildcats. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah, just lifelong skier. And uh, I, I'm definitely not from this industry. It's kind of a whole new right. whole new deal. I uh, right. didn't, you know, always have skied, but uh, worked in the utility industry and um, uh, co-owned a software company that uh, did field automation for utility trucks like gas, electric, telephone, uh, company vehicles, and uh, ultimately we, we sold that to General Electric and uh, ran around the world with them for a while and got tired of working for a, a, a large corporation, right. not, not exactly my bag, and uh, learned a little bit about the, the ski industry, the craft ski industry. Uh, probably not enough to make an informed decision, but, right. uh, but enough to inspire me to... Uh, uh, get involved with it and, and uh, uh, read an article in the Denver Post from, uh, uh, yeah, talking about Meyer Skis and Matt Cudmore, who's, you yep. know, he's the founder of, of Meyer and he's the, the clever one that started it all. And, and uh, yeah, he and I met up out at Sunlight Mountain out in Glenwood Springs yep. and uh, skied a bunch and uh, drank a shitload of beers right. and uh, decided we got along pretty well and complemented each other pretty well and decided to go into business together and we set up a factory out there got Matt out of the garage yep. uh, where he started pressing skis in 2009 okay. incorporated in 2010 and then we set up the factory in Glenwood Springs in the spring of 2012 okay yeah so that's all the industry knowledge that you had going into this huh like you just kind of yeah, none. Just one. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. So, is he still involved now? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. He he's not involved on um, day to day operations. You know, he's right. got a wife, three young kids. Right. Um, he and uh, Rosie, his wife, uh, moved back up to North Idaho. Cool. They're living up in Sandpoint, where they're they're from North Idaho. Parents are up there. Grandparents can help yep. with the kids, and uh, so he's uh, uh, does AutoCAD design work. Has his own company. Uh, staying real busy and comes down here quarterly. We talk regularly about what's new in the in the industry. Talk about materials. Um, talk about product designs and you know. So he's he's still very involved without having the burden of of you know Being kind here. of the day to day operations. Yeah. Okay, cool. So as far as Meyer goes, what what is Meyer? I mean, what is Meyer Ski Company as a whole, right? There's a million ski companies. What makes Meyer unique? Yeah, I think there's a lot of things that make us unique, but we're ever evolving, right? We're right. not, uh, I don't think uh, what we are today is what we'll be five or 10 years from now. Um, but what we try and be is unique and different. Um, and I think that uh, starts probably just from the look of the skis themselves, right? We use a clear right. top sheet on everything we do has a clear top sheet. Still has graphics on it, you know, on the tips and tails, or has windows of wood. Right. But we try and, we've tried to carve out something that is unique to Meyer, which, you know, ski industry's been around for a little while. So to come up with something that is truly unique and different and identifiable to Meyer, um, I think, you know, pretty cool. Right. And, uh, you know, we stay true to it. And it's not easy to use a clear top sheet because you're kind of bearing your soul, your workmanship. Um, you, you can't right. hide mistakes. Yeah. So when everything's covered up in ink and or steel or whatever else, you can have all sorts of mistakes under there. Right. Um, we can't. You can see them. Hmm. Um, so that's one. Uh, you know, we, we position ourselves as striving to be the world's most eco-friendly high-performance ski. And uh, we try and use sustainable materials where it makes sense to do so. We're not willing to compromise performance, but we're always looking for ways to make uh, a more eco-friendly, uh, sustainably produced ski. And that starts with the heart and soul of a ski, which is the wood core. So we use all locally harvested Rocky Mountain Aspen and Beetle Kill pine. Um, the aspen, if you cut down an aspen tree, you'll get anyone that has aspens in their yard, they're, they're like a weed. You, you, right, you right. cut one down in six to eight shoots, and they yeah. always pop up where you don't want them to. Um, and then, you know, the beetle kill pine, there's just a huge epidemic out here in the Rockies. 
um, where the forests have just overgrown. Um, you know, we, in the old days, if there was a fire, they'd burn, right? right. Now we have people living in the urban, interf- excuse me, in the, uh, out in the forest and kind of urban interface areas. And right. So when there's fires, they'll let them burn if they can, but now there's so many people living there, right, we they, put those fires out. out. Right. And uh, logging was greatly reduced through the years. So the bottom line is a lot of the forests are overgrown and they're unhealthy. And uh, uh, so, you know, as a result of that, there's been the, uh, uh, the pine beetle infestation. And, you know, most people that have skied in the Rockies at some point has seen areas where the entire mountain sides are brown and there's, you know, nary a live tree. So we utilize that wood. It's a small part of our core construction and profile, but it's an important part. You know, it looks cool. Um, It's uh, uh, got plenty of strength. In fact, uh, you know, just like with any wood, there's different grading levels. And uh, uh, pine beetle kill wood is actually used in in wood framing of houses and construction um, when you get it at a certain grade level. So, uh, you know, it brings attention to kind of the uh, the eco-friendly side of it and and to, you know, kind of the situation in our in our force hmm. so and you guys make everything in the u.s right we do we make everything right here in denver colorado right in our shop right um, where we're sitting pretty much. where we're sitting pretty yeah. much okay. yeah. um what's why i guess is the question you know like there's so many reasons to make skis overseas they're I mean, mainly cost, you know, obviously the quality takes a hit. There's a lot of things. You lose a lot of the control for sure when you go overseas. Um, but it seems like it becomes even more of a labor of love, I guess, when you're making skis yourself and you're kind of hand making them in your own factory and doing your own deal. Why, why do you guys do it? What's important about that process to you? Yeah, um, I, you know, I think it just speaks to kind of the values that, you know, Matt had when he started Meyer Skis and that, you know, I have in, in kind of joining in, in with him here. And w- there's no reason why a ski company um, can't make it commercially and financially in North America making their own skis here. And, you know, we believe we can control um, the process, we can control the quality, um, we can build right through the season, um, which can make life a lot easier on uh, the retail shops versus having to guess on their buy and hope and pray right. they get snow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You can probably relate. 100%. Yeah. 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 yeah every and, year. And snow makes us all a bit smarter, right? Yeah. But I don't know, man. I don't think I even agree with that. I think it makes us idiots. I, I really do. I think I think it makes us dumb because, like, when there's snow, I take so many risks when I'm doing buys. Like, I just – it's like my brain shuts off almost. That's a good point. Know? I don't know. Like, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but I bet there's a smaller group of us that are like, yeah, let's buy whatever we want. Yeah, you we're know? rolling. Like, we're yeah, rolling right, right Things now. are good. Yeah, so, the, you know, and part of the idea is to – because we're building here locally, we can build to demand, right? Right. Yeah. And we've, I think, introduced a very unique um, and first uh, industry first business model where uh, we sell direct and we sell indirect in a way that protects our retailer partner mm-hmm. community. And we do it just in a very unique and different way. And because so many people focus on, you know, okay, we got to make them cheaper now, so we're going to have them built overseas. Um, And I guess our view of that is it doesn't need to be that way. There's a way to establish and develop a business model whereby your blended margin um, can support the company and allow you to make things locally that cost a bit more. Um, And I think that's that's serving us very well and it allows us to do co-branded partnerships and licensing deals and supply retailers with skis on the fly in a way that protects them and makes them happy 
right. while also selling direct to our customer base. Right. So you kind of follow that, like, there's a bunch of different models, I think, right now, and you guys kind of incorporate all of them almost? I think so. I, right. At least, you know. And that's a good plan. I don't think it's a bad plan. I'm not, you know, but I think it's... Time will be the judge. It will. It always is the judge. It always I, is. I think it's weird, and for people that don't know, right, like there's traditional ski sales, right, where you just buy your skis from your local shop. There's, there's ski wholesalers that just sell direct to consumer, like J Skis or... I don't know. I can't even think of any other ones. There's a bunch. I mean, mo most in the U.S. now, most that manufacture in the U.S. or even have a contract manufacturer mm -hmm. in the U.S. or Canada um, pretty much sell direct to consumer and don't right. sell through a layer of distribution. Right. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's like, and that's pretty much the system. I don't think there's many, some companies will mix like K2, you can buy a K2 ski on their website direct to your house but it's more money, you know, like it's, you're buying it at MSRP versus you go to your local retailer and it's cheaper, right? It's that map pricing, yeah. that, that made up number that they kind of decide which one's real and which one's fake. And so the like made the up kind number of that's so important to the industry. I don't understand it at all. And I uh, wish they'd get rid of, two of it. Us. But yeah. There's a lot of people I think on the, on this side of the fence that are like, we should get rid of it. But then every year they're still, yeah, we, we're not, we don't subscribe to it. We, 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 we don't have map pricing. It's just, it's dumb. But the, one of these days they'll get rid of, well, I don't know, maybe not. I don't think who knows. Yeah. It doesn't matter either way. I guess I probably <laughs> won't be around when they get rid of it. Um, uh, so I guess it's weird to see that you guys mix everything together. And I think, I think it's cool, but I'm why, I guess, why are you trying to do all of the different models? Yeah, I guess cause we want to survive. Right? right. So all this is fun. All this is, uh, uh, works well, but in the end, if, uh, if the math doesn't work, it all ends. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, you know, our belief is, and always has been that there was a way to craft a, a craft a business model that instead of solely selling direct, instead of I was going to use a different term, um, outsourcing your manufacturing to right. China right. or Eastern Europe or wherever it might be, um, that there was a way to improve um, the top line. Right, revenue per unit yep. um, through the combination of selling direct and indirect. And so what we've done is created uh, an industry first piece of software that essentially directs traffic on who's earned what um, so that we're able to protect our retailers, um, uh, carving out territories for them, giving them unique discount codes. Um, we're able to direct traffic and protect our licensed partners. Uh, we do a lot with music, it's yeah. real important to us. So we've got a, a great partnership with uh, Tyri Bluegrass Festival and Planet Bluegrass, um, which is just an awesome event. If, if anyone loves bluegrass, and it's not all bluegrass there, they have other music as well, but out in Telluride in June, it's an unbelievable event, so much fun. Uh, just spectacular scenery, well organized, and it's chaos there. Yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. Um, we work with uh, leftover salmon right now. You know, good friends of ours, great guys. They're they're unbelievable. They're just killing it right now, traveling around the country. So they actually launched their VIP album release and their tour right here at our shop. Um, so it was invite only and. It was, it was so much fun. They had all their partners here. So they have, uh, you know, Bear Creek Distilling yep. down the road, which I, I happened to be there a couple times last weekend. Maybe too much fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Seven Sacred. It's an uh, uh, edibles chocolate truffles company based in Telluride. Yep. Uh, so they had free samples here all <laughs> night long. Uh, it was definitely mayhem by the time the night wrapped up. But it was their, you know, Band is killing it right now, and they have a you know great community around them, great great bunch of partners. So, have a hell of a lot of fun with them, and we do a lot of those things. We're we have a pretty exciting announcement coming up soon, um, but based on when this is going to air, I probably can't can't divulge <laughs> just yet. But everyone will know who this band is, and it's uh, that's going to be fun for us. So cool. So again, that software plays a key role 
in making all of our partners whole. Right. And uh, instead of uh, someone trying to run down a spreadsheet and figure out who the hell gets paid what, yeah. which I can attest is an impossibility, yeah. um, we're automatically, uh, we have an automatic notification system whoever we're working with, as soon as we get an order 15 minutes later, they're getting an email with what was sold, right. you know, who it went to and what they're going to get out of it. Huh. Okay. So you've mentioned a couple times about the industry and kind of, I forget the term that you used already. You said it three seconds ago, but the, I probably forgot it too. So yeah, that's all right. We'll move on. Somebody <laughs> will remind me an email <laughs> later and I'll feel like an idiot. But um, basically ski industry stuff, like, you're probably the right person to ask or one of the right people to ask. Is it healthy right now or is it not healthy right now? I mean, I have my own opinions on it, but, and I think that's kind of a loaded question, right? You know, yeah, like no, you it's a, yeah, I think it's if, a fair question. I, yeah. I, I don't know that, I don't know that I am the right per, I, I can only answer it um, based on my experience and what I know, right? Right. Um, last year was not a great snow season in the Rockies or at least central and southern Rockies, northern Rockies did just fine. Um, you know, our skis are now going all over North America and, and all over the globe. Um, so, you know, other parts of the world and other parts of North America had real good snow. But I mean, we, we doubled last year and our expectation is to double again this year. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're doing pretty well right now. And I think, you know, those that innovate, those that make good product, those that take care of their customers, those that protect their brand, those that are being going about things uniquely, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think in any industry have a good shot of surviving. Is the industry as a whole healthy? I think margins have always been tight on hard goods, and mm -hmm. that's why I think the easy way out is we'll just make them for cheaper. So we'll right. outsource it's always it. Easy way out. Right. Yeah. So we're not going to do that. Yeah. I mean, that's just how it is. We're yeah. going to live or die by this. And yeah. again, time will be the judge, but it, it forces us then to be more creative than we're just going to have our product produced uh, at a lower cost. Right. And, uh, and that's where the business model and some innovation comes into play. And, and that's where, I mean, you guys have seen, you've done a tour here. Right. And when's the last time you walked into a ski factory and the first thing you walk into is a bar? Yeah, never. Right. Not, not and it's not time. just a bar for our friends. We have people from all over the world that have come here to see how skis are made. Right. And we call it a craft skiery. Yep. And we believe it's the first of its kind in the world where we're showing people how skis are made. We're educating them on what materials are used mm -hmm. and letting people see this for the first time. Um, it's not rocket science. All the, no, all the gimmickry of... bullshit yeah. that the big brands like to throw out right. every few years runs its course, it goes away. Otherwise, it'll all still be inherent in the product today, and it's not. It comes down to good design, using good high-quality materials, and good craftsmanship. Right. It's not that complicated. And so, you know, behind our bar, we have this wall of glass, and we're serving beer and wine at the bar. People come in, talk to the ski tender, learn about the brand, have a couple of cold ones, have a glass of wine, talk to their fellow skiers that are in there that are interested in Meyer as well, whether it's an existing customer or someone that's just flown in and heading up on their ski trip and has their family or, you know, their, their whatever big vehicle full of their buddies that are right, going right. on the big crazy ski trip and they come in and have a few cold ones with us, break bread with us and right. learn about the brand and learn how skis and snowboards are made. And that's, you know, it, it's just something that hasn't been done before. So we, we just enjoy that immersive brand experience and experiential kind of uh, uh, experience that we're able to provide to our customer base. And it's just, it's fun. It's, yeah. it's just, a, it's a hell of a lot of fun. I think that's the most important thing. And I, and I guess, like, I, I don't personally think the ski industry is healthy, but I don't think it's healthy... I guess on the retail side more than I think on the wholesale side. Um, but the somebody told me once, and I think it was Bryce from Evo, he said that the most important thing for us is we create an experience for our customer. And I think that's one of the things that you guys do really well. And that's like as we're getting the tour through, you can see that that's yeah. 
important to you guys, right? Like it's taken into account that the customer feels connected to the brand immediately if that's what you're doing. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And whether buying now or five years from now, they're never going to forget coming in here and hanging right. out with us and having some fun and seeing how stuff is made and maybe a little mayhem kicks in and right. you know which often happens here because right. we just had people coming in from all over the place and you know music's going beer's right. flowing and we just have a little fun and it's it's uh, and then we have events here right yeah. I mean music's a big part of it so we've had I mean we've had musicians it's hard for me to even believe we've had. Uh, musicians from Pretty Lights, Thievery right. Corporation, Dopapod, The Motet, Eddie Roberts um, from the new Master Sounds has played here several times. Um, Leftover Salmon right. kicking off their tour here. I mean, we don't have a ton of music here, but when we have it, it's unbelievable. Even that, I mean, it's not like this isn't a state, you know, it's not a venue for it. It's not Red Rocks, you know, like this right, is a right, ski, like right. you guys are making skis here. Yeah, you know, yeah we've had, even have that. Yeah, we've had people play here one night and they're on stage at Red Rocks right. the next <laughs> night. Right. Uh, we had Carl, uh, you know, J.J. Uh, J. Williams from Carl Denson and the Tiny yep. Universe in here, the trumpet player for the Stevie Wonder Band. I mean, it, it you know, kind of blows my mind, really, who right. we've been fortunate enough and blessed to have in here. And, yeah, we have a lot of fun those nights, you know. Right. That's like, and that's one of the things I think that's most important, right, is like, and I think people care less about the money, too, when they're connected to the product. And that goes with anything, I think. And it's not like we're talking like the skis cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Like they're, they cost what high-end skis cost. They're, they're right not, in there. I mean, They're our, with everybody else. Exactly. Could, Standard product, seven to 900 bucks. Yeah. And uh, we do have sales. Like right now, we have the beat the clock sale. It's kind of, yeah. you know, pay us today for skis tomorrow type of approach. Right. And, uh, and uh, every two weeks, you get a little bit less discount. Yeah. And so it encourages people to pull the trigger and, and uh, make it happen. I mean, this summer, for instance, I mean, who buys skis in June, July, and August? Yeah. And, you know, we're up five times over last year. So right. uh, it's not a ton of skis, but, you know, for us, it's pretty meaningful. And Selling I, any skis in the summer is a blessing. Whenever we sell skis in the store in the summer, I'm like, this is sick, man. Yeah, like, this exactly. is what I want to be doing right now. Like, exactly. I like selling bikes and all, but, like, Selling skis is a little more unique, right? Like you feel a little more connected with the person. Buying a bike, a lot of times it's like either they know exactly what they want or they just want a bike to have a bike. You know, with skis, at least with this kind of ski, right, when they're buying a rental ski or they're buying a beginner ski, it's yeah. a little different. Like you're starting their experience Agreed. for them. But when you're buying the nicer stuff, people are like, they're committing. It's almost a relationship, right? It's no, no question. I mean, our, our demographic, they, our, our skiers, they are... They, you know, kind of mired to them is the skiers ski. Right. You know, we're skiers. We've grown up with it. They're skiers. They've skied their whole life. They've grown up with it. And they've reached a point, skiing is important enough to them that they give a shit about what they ski on. They want to know, you know, who made it, that they're, you know, good people that care, that have good values, um, where it's made right here in the United States. And uh, they've had an opportunity to see how they're made and uh, have a good sense for the materials that are used in it. And the fact of the matter is, you know, our customer base, they're really well educated. Right. Right. I mean, they, they dude, know more about ski making than a lot dude. of people. Everybody do. knows everything right now. Like, yeah. it's crazy with the internet and like right. that click button, you can have an answer to whatever you want. Like, yeah. It's crazy. So. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely makes, I, I think it's a good way to go about doing things for sure. Um, so in that, I guess, I have a more industry-related question, I guess. So trade shows are a thing that, like, everybody in the industry seems to like going to, but the companies seem to find less and less worthwhile every year. How do you feel about the whole trade show deal? And I, like... I, I'm like everybody else. Like I like going to them. I like seeing the product. I like touching the product. But there seems to be a shift. It's from, not the parties. It's Adam. not the party. That's not the only reason that I like going. I like <laughs> going because it's fun. You get to see everybody. You're hanging out. So that's like the party aspect of it, I guess. So yeah, that's I guess the same thing. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I guess the most like what it's changing to is like individualized retailer connection kind of. So you're seeing more people, more companies coming to each retailer 
and saying, this is what we have next year. What do you want to buy? It's like what it used to be almost, you know, yeah. like less trade show stuff. Yeah. Um, so we don't do a ton of trade shows. I mean, we do uh, a good number of the, the larger consumer trade shows. Okay. Okay. And they serve us well because we're selling direct and it's a great way to introduce the brand. I remember the first time we did the Boston Consumer Trade Show. Yep. Even though I'm from up there, you know, we didn't know anyone as a ski brand. No one knew us. Right. And I think we sold like 30 pairs, uh, took it's orders for 30 pairs there. there. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, it's always been good to us. And yeah. so so that served us well. And then the industry trade show, obviously, uh, OR acquired SIA. Yep. And uh, it's it's a very long distance from here. It's a mile and a half. Yep. So we leverage that, right? <laughs> right. Um, you know, the, the, the good side of leveraging it is that uh, we do tours. We have a van running the whole time around the convention center. We have a meeting point at our booth. If people want to go have a couple of cold ones, get off the convention floor, it's you meet at this spot. We take them down here, have a couple beers. They run around and see how we make our skis and, and learn about us. We bring them back, and you can do that in an hour. You know, we have a, a big music and event and a party here. Um, during the course of the show, and we usually have some pretty, pretty awesome music, like I laid out before. Yeah. Um, and so we try and leverage it as best we can. The, the bad part is because we're so close, we're very disorganized. So we forget all sorts of shit <laughs> that we think you know we we don't think it through as right, right, as, right, right, as right. thoroughly as yeah, we two should. Miles away, so we end up making like point. eight trips back and forth right. for everything that we forget. Right. But uh, um, seriously, the the trade show OR for us last year was awesome. Um, it was great. And, uh, you know, we're doubling the size of our booth this year. Sweet. And uh, I, I would suggest we're probably one of the few um, North American manufacturers that produces everything themselves at that show. Because most people that sell direct that make their product aren't at the show because they aren't selling through retailers. Right. Yeah, it's true. There's not very many. I mean, there. I feel like... There's not. You can probably count them on one hand. Right. I mean, it's not. Exactly. Yeah, there's not very Exactly. Many. And at this point, I think we're, we may very well be the longest standing. I don't know this for sure. Yeah, so yeah. People yeah. can challenge I'm me. I'm sure, yeah. But, but we got to be right in the top tier of um, North American ski brands that actually manufacture themselves at the SI slash OR show. Right. So and you were telling me earlier to that point, the you guys kind of have a target goal, right? Like you guys want to be one of the biggest. I think we already are. Yeah. Even though we're one still the... small as shit. I mean, no, yeah, I it's mean, all yeah. relative, right? Right. It's, it's all, all relative. relative. But it's, yeah. Right. As far as a North American brand that produces product, I mean, that's kind of how we measure ourselves initially. Right. Um, you know, companies most like us. Um, yeah. I, I, I would think we're probably top five producer, if not top three producer. And, you know, the... You know, no one wants to shoot for number two or number three. So, yeah, the goal is to be, you know, as a brand, the largest manufacturer of skis in North America. And, you know, we believe we can be that within a couple of years. Um, based on the traction we have, which is very palpable, the momentum we have, um, some of the announcements that folks are going to learn about from Meyer in the next uh, month. Right. Uh, we've got some pretty cool stuff coming down that's, okay. that's really hard for me to wrap my head around. But uh, that's just going to drive us that much deeper into uh, into the ski world through ways that are non-traditional. Okay. So how how are you guys growing? I guess you know, like it doesn't seem like there's very many companies actually growing right now. Right. I think everybody's been pretty flat for the last few years. Like it's very spurty, you know. And I think this goes for retail. I think this goes for the wholesale side of things too. Right. Like it's either up or down. Well, for one thing. It's easy to grow a lot when you're small, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, when you're really large, yeah. it gets a little tougher to get those uh, points of growth, right? But, um, yeah. you know, like I say, last year we, we doubled top line growth, and um, we have a, a good chance of doing that again uh, this year. And, um, you know, and, and getting to that scale where we're, we get some economies of scale and can take some cost out of product and start to cover overhead for real. And, you know, really, that's where um, I think, you know, traction begets more traction. And mm -hmm. as long as you are doing right by your customer base 
and you're not taking shortcuts and you're doing the right thing um, with your partners right. and with your customer base um, and having a little fun along the way, right. um, I think things will take care of themselves. So um, time will be the judge, said that a few times, but right now I like our, I like our position. So we talked about basically that Meyer makes high-end skis, basically, like higher-end skis. What, who are you guys trying to cater to? What kind of skier are you guys catering to? say higher-end skis at a price that um, is reachable and attainable by pretty ridiculous. much everyone. It's, yeah, it's not ridiculous. I mean, there's some, like, Renown. I, I, I fucking hate Renown. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if they're on the podcast. I just don't like them. They're too expensive, and because they put some silly putty inside the ski, they act like it's some crazy thing. And I'm sure somebody's going to email me from Renown all upset and stuff, but like, I don't like when they oversell things. I don't like when over, when companies oversell what they're doing. And sure. I don't think you guys are doing that, and I think that the price is... We're talking about price so much that I feel like we should clarify that it's really just not expensive. It's not expensive. It's a high-end ski. It's a premium right. product. You guys just aren't Agreed. making rental skis. You guys Agreed. aren't making low-end stuff. You're yep. making nice stuff. Yep. And that's kind of where you have to play it when you're making stuff in the U.S. Yep. So who are you making skis for, I guess? Right, so our demographic, I mean, um, we made the choice, rightly or wrongly, to not go after kind of the, the park jibber market. Okay. All right. And we actually have a ski for it that we get great reviews on, um, incredibly light, real poppy. But our market, you know, wants to pay very little for a ski. Mm. They beat the living shit out of them, which is what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's yeah, what yeah, they're yeah. doing, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, steel on steel all day long. And, and everyone and, wants to be sponsored. Right. Yeah. And, and, and everyone wants to be sponsored. And, and we're all about that. Yeah. But from a business model standpoint, we didn't see that to the, as the path to prosperity. Yeah, right. It's a, it's, it can be a tough cr crowd. Um, yeah. uh, they're tough on their skis, and you know they, they and, and you know, mom might come along who bought the skis and say, you know, little Johnny skis broke. You know, I, I want another pair of skis. And right. and and for the most part, these kids that are living in the park, which is sick. I mean, really, it's amazing. Right. They're in there <laughs> like as. Every, every waking moment right. they can be in there, they're in there. And as you know, they'll go through three pairs of skis in a oh, season. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right. Yeah. So that's a challenge we didn't want to deal with. Yeah. Right? So, you know, we, we approach it more the skier ski, and we go everything from a front side carver, you know, okay. low 70s underfoot, all the way up to your fat pal ski, 132 underfoot, and everything in between. Um, and I think this industry evolved out of fatter skis, did, yeah. um, right. I mean, that's kind of where it started. And, you know, some real innovators out there that were doing things that the big brands didn't do. And then I think the smaller brands kind of got typecast and and maybe it was a self-fulfilling prophecy where right. we're a small brand. So we make fat skis and that was it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny for us, our first big breakout model, everyone loved our skis. But we weren't killing it because yeah, yeah. they were for really, really good skiers. Right. Right. Not everyone can go ski a uh, you know one ten underfoot. Um, not a lot of side cut. Pretty straight <laughs> right. ski. I mean, that's just you know, you're, you, it's a small percentage of the skiers that are comfortable on that. Right. So, you know, it's funny. Matt went north in the Rockies one season. I was kind of central south, and we're comparing notes along the way, and we're like. We need to we need to ski like with some side cut, probably like you know, uh, high 80s, around 90, and we kind of introduced that on the fly, which is another advantage of being your own ski manufacturer. Yeah. I mean, we would have had to have had our order already in to whomever. Yeah. Right. Like in, a year in advance. Exactly. Least, exactly. Yeah. And we're like, shit, man, let's just let's <laughs> right, let's make it happen, right? So you know, Matt Matt's the kind of guy we'll go out and drink a shitload of beer and I'm heading home to bed, you know, he'll head to the factory. I come in in the morning and he's got a ski. He's like, yeah, let's go skiing. Let's go try this, you know? And, uh, that's, that's just how he's wired, which is pretty amazing. That's awesome. So, so we, we, you know, we introduced the quick draw, right? Yep. 88 underfoot, good bit of side cut, it's light poppy, traditional camber, some early tip rise. And we freaking kill it with that ski. Kill yep. it. I mean, there's just no one, I, I say no one. 
generally speaking. <laughs> right. No one that gets on that ski comes back and it's like, that sucks. No, that's usually fun. That ski's it, really fun. It's yeah. fun as hell. And, and so that, that, I guess that gave us hope. You know? Right. And it's like, well, maybe it shouldn't all be fat skis, you know? Let's, let's look at skis that actually a lot of people ski on. Right. I think everybody's guilty of that, though. You know, like, we always buy fat skis to put them on the wall because they're wall art almost. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, they're big graphics. They're loud. They're fun to look at. Yeah. Everybody goes, whoa, why do you have water ski? And we're like, I don't know. Like, we just, we sell, I mean, we sell them. But, like, we're selling 10 versus selling 1,000 of whatever else exactly. we're selling, you know? So, that it makes sense for a ski company. So, that, you know, you don't have to be a mathematician to figure out that you might want to sell some skis that a lot of people buy. Yeah, no, it, it makes a lot of sense. I don't know why... It's taken so long, and I guess to your point earlier, like it makes sense that a small company makes powder skis. Like for whatever reason, in my head, it's in there too, and that's what people buy, and that's what people think of with small companies. And it's almost like from the retail side of it, and it's wrong, but this is how I look at it. I just look at it, and I'm like, I don't think that this carving ski is going to be as good as a carving ski that's made by Vocal or a carving ski that's made by K2 or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? And there's no, there's zero bearing on it. Like, there's zero sure. reason for me to say that other than I just say it. Like, it's just, and I know other people do it, I too. I probably would have said the same thing, too, if we hadn't converted so many people from Rozzy and Atomic and K2 and <laughs> right. other big and brands to And I know it skis as skis, well. And after so. I ski it, I can tell you it skis as well. But, like, in my head, even, like, even now, that idea is, like, yeah. if you want a powder ski, you're going to buy it from, like, an indie kind of brand, right? Yeah. You're not going to buy... People don't really buy K2 pontoons, but everybody buys wide skis from Icelandic and you guys, I'm sure, yeah. and all these other companies. But so I, I don't know what there is that we can do to make that. I think we're doing it. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I'll put our fucking skis up against any right. brand in the world. All right. I, 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 I haven't skied the new one. What's the narrow, the new narrower one called? Uh, Bangtail. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't yeah, skied we're, it yet. we're actually killing it with the Bangtail really? right now. <laughs> Yeah, it's that sick, skis, dude. Like it's... that ski is doing really well for us. So, right. uh, I, I, you know, to take a similar ski, right, with yeah. the same intended purpose for what that ski is supposed right. to do. I, 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 you know, even if someone, you know, obviously if they're blindly loyal, there's not much we're going to be able to do. No. But if they're loyal yet open-minded to trying something different, I, I, I'm, I like our position. Get, yeah. you know, the challenge is either getting on the skis or trusting us to begin with. Right. Yeah. I guess that's the way to do that's it. That's fine. You know, we do a customer feedback survey. So every year, I don't know. I, I don't imagine too many ski brands do that, but we reach out directly yeah. and we really lay it out there, right? You know, people have an opportunity to really give it to us. <laughs> right. Um, thankfully, only two did last year. Uh, the rest of them, uh, it was way over the top positive. Okay. Uh, tons of great comments. But I mean, at this point, uh, we're approaching 70% of our. Uh, our customers and customers uh, didn't try the skis at first. And for us, that's pretty exciting because it was only a few years ago, if we saw someone on our skis, we knew their name, right? I mean, <laughs> right. and they yeah, probably yeah, tried yeah, our yeah, skis yeah. eight different ways. Yep. So, you know, that, that people are now trusting us. And if you go on the internet and, you know, check out the Google or check out Facebook reviews right. or, or even, uh, there's some following. Yeah, even TripAdvisor or Yelp or whatever. Right. Uh, you know, the reviews are just way over the top, way over the top. And there's hundreds and hundreds of them out there. And we typically score right up close to a five, you know, all the way around. So. Okay. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how that changes, I guess. And I think there's a lot of companies guilty of it, you know, that just like, they're, I mean, Fatipus existed, right? And that's all they made pretty much yeah. was fat stuff, you know? Yep. And I think their their stuff was cool. Well, they're but, one, of, one of the big innovators for sure. Right, right, but there's no, you can't just be around making just that stuff. You have to make skis for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that, that's going to be the interesting thing, I guess, going forward is seeing how these smaller companies can kind of integrate themselves with the bigger companies and how they work together. Because we're kind of in a position now where like, seems like the small hills are getting bought out by the big hills, right? True. Like that's happening every day. It seems like veiled by somebody else. Yep. And ski companies are less like that, but it's still happening. So I guess it's, it's always interesting to see where things go. Yeah. Yeah. No know? doubt. Um, and yeah, who, who knows, right? No one has yeah. a crystal ball. What we're trying to do, the way we look at it is there's millions of skis um, produced and purchased every year globally. And 
there's plenty of room for us to grow. Sure. And, you know, slowly pull people from the brands they've traditionally skied or maybe they weren't tied to a specific brand and uh, by doing things uniquely and differently. And that's, you know, that's kind of what we're about. Right. Yeah. No. And I think you guys are, I think you guys are killing it. And honestly, like one, I think once people see some of the video from what we did today and listen to this, like it's, it's refreshing almost to see the step-by-step process and seeing the stuff made. Like you feel more, like even I feel like I knew about the brand, right? And I liked the brand beforehand, but I feel more connected to the brand already. Well, think about it. You've, you've probably bought thousands and thousands right. and thousands of right. skis. Right. And now you can see kind of sort of how they're made. Right. right exactly. <laughs> like you get an idea. Like it's like, I know if you asked me what was in a ski, I could tell you what's in a ski sure, because sure. it's on a piece of paper. But right. like you don't watch it. You don't see the materials at every step and you don't see the people making it. So I think that's an important part to this whole deal. Yeah, and it's funny. When we do our happy hour tours, because we're too busy during the day to have people back in the shop. It's right. chaos back there. That's why we have you know, the, the craft skiery zone with a wall right. of glass behind us so people can watch the action from the bar, right. uh, the safe confines of their bar stool. Right. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, the... Uh, the heck was, oh, yeah, so at the end of the day, we have our, our happy hour tour. So people come in, you know have a couple of beers, chatting, learning about the brand, and we go through it. And so often when we do the tour, you always have those that are incredibly eager and we're just dying to see how skis are made. And then you have some that are in the back of the group just texting and don't really give a shit. And I, I get that. It's not for right. everyone. But it's funny. By the time we get to, like, the second or third station, and, of course, we're having fun, we're all drinking a couple yeah, of beers, yeah, yeah. we're cracking jokes, and they end up often being the ones asking the most questions. And it's like, right. oh, you woke up back yeah, there. You're yeah, going to yeah. join right. us now. You figured out that you actually can be involved. Right, but you, you pique their interest too. And yeah. and that's telling when you have the people that <laughs> seem to not give a shit suddenly care a lot. Right. So that's so I guess this kind of goes to my last, my last question is how are you guys dealing with the whole social media thing, right? Social media is probably... I'll argue it till I'm blue in the face that it's the most important way to market stuff going forward, at least for unless something else changes, you know, but it's the sure. most important way to engage with your customer because it's lit your product in their face, in their hand. Sure. And your brand is in their hand, basically. Yeah. So how are you guys handling that? What are you guys doing with social media? How much attention are you paying to it? I mean, am I wrong? I mean, I don't yeah, know. No, yeah. I agree with you. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, that is how you can most easily connect with your audience and people that should be in your audience. Right. And so we put a ton of effort into it. Right. Um, does it mean we're the best at it? No. Right. In fact, you know, we meet every week on, you know, how, right. how can we do better? Um, but we try and keep it, um, we try and not be, we try and not take ourselves too seriously. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're trying to make the best skis um, in the industry. So we do care very much about um, our production practices and processes and all that goes into that. But at the same time, um, you know, when you go skiing, right, everything about skiing, you're having fun. You're right. laughing. I mean, every now and then you see someone having a shitty day skiing, but, you know, that's their problem, Doesn't right? Really, you got to yeah. get over it and move yeah, on right. and regroup. And I'm not you know, with those people anyway. Exactly, you know, so, exactly. It's yeah. about fun and then you're at the bar and everyone's laughing and having a ball i mean so we try and extend that to right. here and uh uh you know so we we try and just yeah make it make it so that we're we're just having a great time here and that that extends through the social media platforms we even do i don't know if you've seen any stuff we put out we do like goofy videos that yeah. uh, so when we started production here we start usually every year that there's the running of the bulls in Spain so you know we did a running of the bulls video with all of our <laughs> all of our production guys you know wearing the white suits and yeah. everything and and uh, yeah, just whatever goofy stuff right but, right but we're saying hey we're, we're back producing skis and you know it shows everyone getting to their workstations and firing everything up and at the end of the day having a beer at the bar having fun uh we did a uh for our sale we do the beat the clock sale yeah so you know the movie uh office space yep. right where they uh, pull the printer out of the trunk of the the, the car and they beat the shit out of it, you know, with bats and everything. <laughs> so we had a clock that, you know, beat the clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
very, very imaginative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> I like same how you guys connected. Same there. exact yeah, yeah. thing where we, you know, pull the pull the clock out and beat the shit out of it, and and uh, so we try and keep it light, keep it fun, and give a sense for the lifestyle without getting too too serious. I like that. Um, so I think we'll wrap this thing up here. Um, I appreciate you coming and. Or us coming to I was you and say, chatting. I, I, we, I work here. Coming into this room that you are in <laughs> charge of. Yeah, yeah. Um, I appreciate you having us here um, and letting us see everything. I mean, it's great to see a factory like this. It really is. And I think people will really appreciate it. Um, where can people find the skis? Where can they find you on social media? Yeah, uh, MeyerSkis.com. And Meyer can be spelled a hundred different ways. <laughs> so it's M E I E R skis.com. Yeah. Um, and I think it's what's our phone number eight four four Wood Skis, without the there you S. Go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so we're pretty easy to find. If you come to Colorado, come to Denver uh, yep. on your uh, on your ski trip. Um, yeah, come and see us. We're we're literally right next to downtown, not far from Mile High Stadium. Um, I guarantee we'll have beer on tap, wine here, and uh, usually we're having some fun. So you're about off of I-70, you're about 10 minutes down the highway next to downtown, and then you can shoot right back out of 6th Avenue, right. uh, and you're heading right up into the mountains. And we've had to buy some of our customers a, a hotel room here from time to time because the pass is, you know, the tunnel's That's closed. Show, yeah. It's just puking up there, and they're drinking that, beer here. So it's like, oh, just hold up for the night and go up I can't up believe the they don't have a better way yet to get people through that shit. Right? And that's the most aggravating thing is, like, when it's a pow day and that shit's closed. Like, I, it's happened to me at SIA or OR three times now. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, <laughs> there are so many cars. The congestion on the weekends is unbelievable. Yeah. That's why we, we kind of shift our work week here yeah. so that, you know, the guys have the Sunday, Monday off so they can maybe enjoy a little bit of football and then Monday have a, have a ski day without the, yep. without the crowds and the traffic. Right. I mean, people want to be here. People want to go skiing, you know. That's it. Cool. Yeah. All right, Ted, thank you. Yeah, right on. Thank yeah. you, man.